Hello and welcome to this recorded e-learning on basic HDL coding techniques part 2. My name is Frank Nelson. I'll be your instructor for this module. This module introduces some more of the HDL coding techniques that most FPGA designers use for design construction. This module introduces some of the primary concepts that impact the quality of results a designer will get when synthesizing for a Xilinx FPGA. This module also provides some detailed recommendations about creating effective HDL that will provide high speed and use minimal FPGA resources. If you are an experienced ASIC designer or new to FPGA design, this module will help you reduce your learning curve and get productive faster with your new FPGA design. This module will help you build good HDL code that will use minimal FPGA resources and get good performance. These practices are designed to promote fast and efficient FPGA designs. After completing this module, you'll be able to identify some basic design guidelines that successful FPGA designers follow. You'll also be able to select a proper HDL coding style for fast and efficient finite state machines. And lastly, you'll be able to pipeline your design in the most common and most necessary situations. The first recommendation is to always put the next state logic and the outputs of the state machine into separate process or always blocks. When this happens, the largest and most complex finite state machines will yield better performance since resource sharing is prevented. Resource sharing often hurts the speed of the large finite state machine. Now note that if your finite state machine is small, it may not benefit you to follow this recommendation as much as it would certainly if it was larger. But of course, whether the state machine is complex will also impact whether or not this will benefit you. Ideal finite state machines have inputs, outputs, and control and enable signals. It is inefficient to build finite state machines with arithmetic logic, data paths, or combinatorial functions included with the construction of the finite state machine. When this happens, there is less logic to create timing critical paths. Remember that most designs that include finite state machines find timing critical paths that pass through the finite state machine. So careful consideration of the design of the finite state machine is not only good for speed, but also important for building a reliable FPGA design. This is because finite state machines often expose glitches and ground bounce problems designers have already built into their FPGA design. Your finite state machine encoding is important for both size and speed of your design, especially if it is large and or complex. Most synthesis tools have commands to encode finite state machines when enumerated types are used. When synthesis tools make decisions like this, it is not always the best choice. I recommend building the machine and then synthesizing for binary one hot and gray encoding and then comparing the speed and the size of the machine made. After construction, it takes little effort to test each encoding style. One hot encoding is thought to build the fastest finite state machine, but th this is simply not always true. The case, it simply depends on the complexity, the number of inputs, and the number of states. Most synthesis tools will choose one hot encoding based purely on the number of states. In fact, most will choose one hot encoding when the state machine has between 8 and 16 states. The benefits of controlling the encoding of your finite state machine are mainly size and speed. But it is interesting to note that years ago, most FPGA customers came to be concerned about their encoding because of design reliability issues. Ten plus years ago, many customers were just not used to employing synchronous design techniques in their FPGA. This was mainly due to ASIC conversion, but in the end, their design had to be synchronous to operate properly. But still many customers had problems with their designs operating, and this would usually show itself by the finite state machine glitching. This was because most designers use binary encoding, and when a design glitches, it would usually cause the binary encoded state machine to expose the flaw. So they would call the hotline, explain the issue, and the application engineer 
would fix the problem by convincing them to go to one hot encoding. Now, this worked most often because only two bits switch at one time, while binary encoding can allow many bits to change at each time. Well, now that everyone designs synchronously, there are no benefits to going to one hot encoding for reliability. In the end, however, one hot encoding can give more speed, depending on the finite state machine, at the expense of having a larger size. So often the question comes about, which encoding style is best? Well, it depends on the complexity, the number of states, and the number of inputs to the finite state machine. The more inputs and states, the more LUTs will have to be cascaded in series, and the slower your state machine may run. Bottom line, the more complex your finite state machine, the more you will benefit by trying all three and comparing the result. Don't expect your synthesis tool to do that kind of work. It's just too much to expect. Now this finite state machine is pretty basic. There are four states and two output signals, really small. So really choosing a coding style here for such a small state machine wouldn't be worthwhile. It's just too tiny. Note how the outputs are not defined in the same always block. They have been placed into a separate always block in effect to simplify and allow pipelining of the design. Note the reset used. It is asynchronous. That's not a good idea. This example should remove the reset reference from the sensitivity list in order to make the design synchronous and assure it will operate properly. So there's two things to note here. Don't bother trying to encode your small state machine. Make sure you use a synchronous reset and separate your outputs from your next state decode. This slide shows the rest of the finite state machine. This always block shows the next state logic as part of a large case statement. Note that it uses a default statement. This will reduce the size of the finite state machine and is critical. So make sure you use a default statement. Here we see a finite state machine encoded for binary by using the parameter statement. This is very helpful. It will be a simple task now to re-encode it for one hot encoding or gray encoding and then test the synthesis result of the state machine for both speed and size. And this will easily allow us to control and decide which is the best state machine for your application. Now just to show you how easily it can be done, now we have simply re-encoded the state machine for one hot encoding. You probably already knew this, and you could have easily done it yourself. No big deal. But again, we're just trying to highlight how easy it is to change it by using the parameter statement. Now we're going to look at the same finite state machine, but coded in VHDL. So again, we see four states and two outputs. Nothing new here. And on this slide, we see that the next state transitions are defined in a large case statement with the finite state machine outputs also defined. Now, this is not recommended since most finite state machines are larger than this one and more complex, and they would get better speed by separating the outputs from the next state logic. This is the synchronous portion of the finite state machine. Note that with this construction, the outputs are also registered. While this is perfect to register the outputs, in essence, effectively pipelining an output stage, note that the reset signal is asynchronous. So not a good idea to build it asynchronously. You'll need to recode this to make it synchronous to assure it will operate. But again, adding the register stage rather than leaving it purely combinatorial is very good, as we'll learn more when we get into the pipelining discussion. On this slide, we have built a larger finite state machine and not defined its encoding. When synthesis tools see this, they usually encode it as binary if it has less than eight states. And it will code it to one hot encoding if it has less than 16 states, and gray if it has more than 16 states. It's also interesting to note that synthesis tools assign state values starting with the leftmost value in the list. So state 1 would be all zeros, state 2 would be 001, 
etc., etc., and then state 7 would be 110.